Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar of on headless e-commerce. From CTOs to CTOs, only practical first-hand experience, technical insight and case studies. My name is Piotr Karwatka and I am CTO of Divante, an e-commerce company. We've been focused on API first headless implementation projects for some time already. One of our best known products is open source project called View Storefront. Uh, PWA for e-commerce, you can run against any e-commerce backend. I'm really excited because today my guest is Halil Koklu, CTO of Lovecrafts, a global community for crafters and makers. Halil, it's really good to have you here. It's great to be here. Always a pleasure talking to you. Awesome. Uh, I think that the context is pretty important. So the context is that we are working together with Lovecrafts on uh, migrating the monolithic e-commerce to next-gen platform. Uh, it's based on commerce tools plus view store from next on the front end. And by the same time, uh, Halil and Lovecraft as an organization, together with Divanta, are building the open source connector between commerce tools and the view store from next. So it's, it's a really exciting project. Uh, prior to Lovecraft, Halil led technology at Rocket Internet in Namsi, the largest online fashion retailer in the Middle East. What else should we know about your experience, Halil? Well, um, I'd say I've pretty much only done e-commerce all my career. Um, still liking it. I um, was busy writing online shops in high school, um, back then in PHP. Um, later moved on to Magento in 2009, so it was quite early um, with Magento back then. Um, have worked on on some larger websites, um, including um, including a multi-level marketing company which um, had like more than twenty languages, countries, um, oh. really old um, ERP integrations with like IBM i series, and that also involved um, building um, something like a nutrition questionnaire, so that at the end of that questionnaire it would throw an individualized um, nutrition supplement. Um, there was also our perfume configurator. Um, so you could uh, configure your uh, perfume from the, um, from the bottle to the packaging. Um, so I've, I've built that, the in integration um, from the online shop to the feeding the uh, jobs into the machine. That was quite interesting because you were um, in that big hall standing next to a 63 meter long machine and wow. then you would throw thousands of jobs in there for a stress test um, and see what's, go what's going to happen. So kind of perfume printer. Yeah, you could say like that. There was uh, laser machines involved and um, all sorts of things. Um, I, I later then um, moved on as a Magenta expert to Rocket Internet. Um, I've started um, with their Brazilian ventures, later moved on to their own stack, um, was technical lead in some of the Turkish ventures, and then um, moved on to uh, be the CTO for Namshi and Mizado. Uh, Namshi you mentioned is a fashion retailer, whereas Mizado was something like an Amazon clone. It actually started um, as Lazada. Lazada happened uh, to be later bought by mm -hmm. uh, Alibaba in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, but th these were the two um, teams I was um, dealing with. And then um, surprisingly, it was one of my first product development organization experience. Uh, so running an organization like that um, and somehow also had to deal with the first for that um, platform. So we were the first to do multilingual, multi-currency, um, first to migrate to AWS. Um, we got a lot of DDoS attacks, so DDoS protection and cloud infrastructure were things I learned there. Awesome, sounds, sounds really like something really complex. Uh, and Lovecraft is one of the biggest crafting community websites and marketplaces around the globe. Started, I guess, in 2012. So uh, can you maybe please share some background? How did you join the company? Yes, I, as I mentioned, uh, Rocket. So it's it's a very fast and dynamic place. Um, so we, we kept joking amongst ourselves um, that uh, a year at Rocket is like three years elsewhere. But that pace also came with downside. So uh, they would hire hundreds of people and then fire them half a year later. And mm. my team wasn't spared from this. Um, one team got um, fired in my absence. Um, so I had decided I can't um, support that ethically and decide, um, decided to move on. Um, so I was mm. looking for something more meaningful when I moved to London. 
Um, and Lovecraft happened to be the first company I spoke to. I was blown away by Edward, um, Nigel, and Cherry, um, old friends who decided to uh, fi- found the company together. Um, they did that with their own savings, with a mission to serve the crafts community, and a visionary way of uh, running a company. I was immediately drawn to this and then started uh, literally the next day. And that was almost seven years ago. Wow. So it was and it still is a uh, long run. <laughs> so, it is. So what else makes Lovecraft unique and what's, what's the business model? I, I have to start with my co- colleagues. So um, first mm-hmm. of all, they are crafters themselves. Um, so you could say Lovecraft is built and run by crafters for crafters. Like you might say with V Storefront, right? So yeah. made by developers for developers. And our users are not just reaching out for things like, where's my order? Um, but they also get help with crafting. So it's not uncommon that um, a colleague would uh, be crafting a user's project to find out where exactly they got stuck to help them resume their project. And this can't be done in a few minutes. It's really time consuming and requires passion. And I'm probably one of the least experienced in, in crafting, uh, but we do learn even as engineers how to knit. And uh, at the moment, I'm um, trying myself on an embroidery project to learn more really? about that craft. Yeah. Really? Wow. <laughs> but it's not, it's not just those crafts either. Uh, you know, for example, Bob, our head of infrastructure and security, he's currently making face shields for medical staff in, in the UK. So we have a wow. really crafty team. Yeah, awesome. Um, and second, I would say we are known for our wide range of patterns. Patterns you could call um, maybe designs or instructions. Um, in a technical term, it could be content. Um, so if you want to make something, you, you're looking out for inspiration, like how, mm-hmm. um, what shall I make? Um, what have others made? Um, it's, it's not very common that um, you just um, knit something out, out from top of your head. Uh, my mom does that. I don't know how she makes that. But generally, uh, people are looking for um, things others have made, potentially even um, brands who are um, supplying or making yarns or fabrics or threads. They would mm-hmm. uh, provide their uh, patents as well. Um, so when you find something um, you like, you, you, you get that pattern. So how's, how's, how, what's a pattern? So when you go, you, you, uh, in, in most of the uh, crafts, it's, it's a PDF file. You open mm-hmm. that PDF file. We also have an app um, to um, open the PDF in, in the app, and you can annotate, write okay. stuff on it, and uh, keep track of where you are. Uh, but generally, it's, all, it's like instructions, almost like coding. Uh, it yeah. has a lot of abbreviations and um, and it would um, it would tell you what to do in which order, and then yeah. you would end up with the same result as um, as uh, on the photo. Um, when and- when you first when you first you know uh, showed me this model for me it was kind of GitHub for for you know uh, for for these designs <laughs> a huge library when you can pick and choose and do your own stuff based on some somebody else's designs. Yeah, actually, uh, that's a very good reference. We wanted to be the GitHub uh, for patents, and mm-hmm. uh, we started that designers platform where designers can upload their patents and um, uh, sell on our platform. And while while they um, create these these designs, um, we were trying um, to have a standard format on how we would um, document that pattern. Awesome. I know that you are shipping to 200 something countries, right? Around the globe. Yes. Um, and it's all from a single multilingual website. So there's not really time without traffic. Uh, and mm-hmm. there's, it also requires a well oiled operational machine behind this. Um, so the patents are usually either PDF, most of them are PDFs. We still mm-hmm. have a few printed patents. But the, um, the third thing we do is. Um, in order to make the pattern, you need the materials required, yarns, needles, yeah. buttons, and so on. Um, so we, would, we, we, we have that information about the pattern, and we would um, tell you as a user what you need. And then you can, um, if, you need, if you don't have them in your, what they call stash, um, you can buy uh, materials from us. You can also substitute colors to, okay. to um, choose the colors you like. And the size of the garment, for example, if you if you have an X large, um, you need more material than a small garment. 
And finally, um, our nice. users can share those projects with fellow crafters as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, which in return inspires others, or you get feedback from your um, from your fellow crafters. So it's it's really growing. It's also about growing the community itself, right? Yes. Um, so the community is growing every day. I remember that uh, when we first met. I guess it was something around a year ago or so. Uh, we were discussing the Magento's end of life. Um, which is, uh, by the way, this year. Uh, can you say more about your current stack? Yes, it's uh, this year. Actually, it's um, two months left um, until the end of life for Magento 1. Um, so yes, we the transaction part of our product is still run by Magento. We have spent many years scaling Magento from an infrastructural perspective, like uh, deploying it on, on the cloud and making it performant, mm -hmm. but also from a functional perspective. It requires significant investment uh, with Magento One to like um, to do a truly global business at scale. So you need mm -hmm. things like multi housing, proper multi currency, taxation, performance tweaks, indexing, caching, bulk changes. All these things are not straightforward and not mm -hmm. achievable overnight. Um, but Magento is only one part of our product. We have built a community. Um, we have built uh, the content part of our product, uh, Bespoke, uh, with amongst others, um, Symphony. And there's also a good set of internal systems running both for the business and operationally, but also from an infrastructure perspective. Um, we're operating in the AWS cloud. Um, we're using a lot of AWS services. Um, we do infrastructure as code, um, continuous delivery, um, and so on. So you decided to change the platform in the end and go headless with PWI as a front end. So maybe before we get into the reasons of, uh, of picking this architecture, let's sing with our listeners and say something more general on what headless architecture means and what it means to you, Halil. Um, so headless, the simple answer is that platforms providing the um, business value, like the e-commerce or the CMS, um, are doing so without a front end, without the hat, those headless. Mm -hmm. They instead provide the value through um, fast, extensive, up-to-date APIs. And if done right, all the functionalities, uh, including things like admin processes or import exports are available through APIs. Um, and then mm -hmm. the result is that you have full control over your front end. So you can focus building a great user experience. You're not held back by um, the legacy of your um, backend platforms. So uh, this is um, actually where the backend for front-end BFF pattern come into the pictures, right? Having optimized input-output for specific platforms. Um, more and more e-commerce platforms uh, actually do, do this by using GraphQL uh, to provide this uh, backend for front-ends at, at scale. Yes, um, GraphQL is one of the tre trends we welcome. Um, if you have multiple front-ends um, or touch points like native apps and kiosks, for example, um, having go, going through one uh, mm -hmm. backend um, helps to um, minimize the duplication of um, business logic. So you you should try not to do any business logic in your front end. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, obviously in contrast to let's say the model view controller MVC applications um, we had in the past or still uh, they're still around today. Um, so the business logic um, can be accessed by including code. So you you would be in the View, for example, and then you would, um, or you're in the controller, you would load the data from uh, the model and then you would inject that into the front end. Um, this does mm -hmm. not work um, in this setup because you, the consumer code might not be on the same server, might have a different language or be a completely different platform. Yeah. Um, for example, in case of Magento 1, you have the code in business logic, in controllers, models, views. Um, so it's really a nightmare for consistency. Um, and also, like you can scale the front end and back end separately. Um, when you when you have them separate, the back end might be fine, but you might need more front end servers. Yeah, I guess we we get into into this point, like developing those two parts at different paces. Uh, but first, let me ask you: Is this the first time you are adopting the headless architecture? Not at all, Piotr. In fact, um, headless architecture is not new at all. Um, at the very least, if you have a front end which um, talks to APIs, you have already some element in place. I would personally say that headless commerce is a buzzword which um, 
it describes the emergence of API first or API only off the shelf solution. So we're not talking about bespoke implementations anymore, but major e-commerce software vendors adopting this trend. Um, so the market is moving from all-in-one, one-stop platforms to a bring your own front-end mod- modular proposition. That's actually a good point. So uh, the APIs seemingly weren't the key priority for the established platform vendors. And in in e-commerce, the platforms are very often taken as a shortcut. uh, I mean, shortcut of the of the time to the market. So probably even more than in other ventures, right? Yes, definitely. Having APIs on its own is not sufficient. They need to be designed for the front end. Um, they they they're not first class citizens in the platforms we used uh, to work with in the past. Um, so good luck consuming product data, for example, for your front end via SOAP in Magento One. Yeah, but they're done that. I can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so content is like uh, commerce tools, for example. They started with headless, and had a good head start. And uh, they're spearheading this at the moment, whilst uh, the larger players who have started traditionally um, are still investing in this. Um, mm. They're waking up from this now. They can't just rely on their market dominance anymore. Um, but this transformation takes a long time. Um, so they're either incomplete or with more or less success. Um, but I must say here at Lovecrafts, um, the community product we built is headless since 2014. Um, so we built an API with some neat features like expandable queries, um, similar to GraphQL, a symphony-based front-end, um, as well as native apps are consuming from this API. And in 2018, um, we uh, streamlined our editorial content uh, from like WordPress for the blog, mm. and uh, we were using Magento CMS for the static pages to Prismic, which is a headless content management system. Yeah. Um, and personally, back in 2011, 2012, um, at Rock Internet, we launched uh, various e-commerce businesses with um, their platform. The platform was called Alice and Bob, where Alice is a front end and Bob is a back end. It was not as tidy as the ones we um, we see today, but I felt like it was still um, somewhat novel. Um, and actually, the original authors went um, on to other ventures, and they have rec- uh, recently launched this as a product. It's called uh, Spryker. Yeah, Spryker is a pretty interesting platform. Uh, hopefully, uh, I will get to to the founders and invite them to to interview in uh, one of the uh, further episodes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me let me ask you about the the key reasons uh, to go towards this architecture. So you were on Magento, decided to go to Headless. What, what were the key reasons for that? To be honest, as the engineering team uh, at Lovecraft, we've been talking about this um, architecture since the beginning. Um, Obviously, it evolved over time, the strategy um, with the technologies made available. Um, Whilst we adopted this architecture for community content, the commerce part has not made it yet for various reasons. Um, So Magento's front-end is still dominating um, uh, the user experience. Um, So as you know, we are like weaving together commerce, community, and content for our makers. You can't really fragment the user experience with uh, by which backend or legacy system is used. We need these three mm-hmm. pillars to be intertwined. Um, until now, we were trying technologies like Edge Site includes ESIs, which don't really work from a um, performance perspective. And also, like yeah. if you if you run multiple front ends, you end up with um, CSS and JavaScript, which needs to be shared. So that's um, also like a productivity or performance issue to yeah. ensure that they're up to date. Um, so we needed like a Backend agnostic, um, unified user experience. Um, that's a fundamental reasons, but there are also obviously other benefits and uh, opportunities we'd like to pursue um, once once we have this uh, front end. So you have this direction. You need to have the the, the rest of the puzzles, the the backend and front end platform. Uh, the project we are currently in is is is, is a really interesting one because you picked commerce tools as a backend and view storefront next uh, as a front-end application so i'm i'm wondering about the uh, decision factors to choose uh, commerce tools um as we we were talking about it before i know it, it wasn't an easy decision yes it wasn't easy but actually when you look at commerce tools um it's very straightforward you get uh, drawn to it very quickly uh the time consuming bit is um is looking at the details 
Um, to mm-hmm. summarize really what commerce tools is, why we chose commerce tools, um, let's start with the chemistry. Like it's yeah. a bullshit free company, approachable, you have access to people and uh, they give you honest, valuable feedback. It's API only, it has GraphQL support, um, it's modular so you can pick and choose. Um, this is great if you don't want to be um, dependent on a major platform. So you could, for example, um, there might be new use cases or it might not fulfill your expectations so that you might say, uh, we need to move our catalog to something else, but you can still continue using the checkout. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a great and complete documentation. Um, like you understand the representations, the um, the APIs uh, immediately. Um, and it, it, it fulfills most of our requirements. Um, it actually had the best overlap with our uh, requirements um, compared to uh, all the other platforms. Um, the pro- data model is very sensible and scalable. Uh, translations are, for example, represented in localizable attributes rather than uh, requiring a whole new front, a uh, whole new uh, store in Magento, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, the pricing model is flexible, and you have this um, staging capability, so you you can make changes to, the, to your products, uh, but publish at the end, um, either by doing QA or have some other processes. Uh, so this allows you to use the uh, catalog as a PIM as well. Whereas, for example, yeah. in Magento, you save a product and then it's immediately public. Yeah. In, in Magento too, it's changed, but still. So uh, it, it's, uh, it looks like very well thought and very good decision. Um, but I, I must ask what other solution have you considered? Yeah, so we wanted to give this a due process, right? So I can't just go and say I like commerce tools and we go with yeah. it. Um, so we have to um, we have to be sure because a platform a platform change like this doesn't happen often. Um, you want to make sure that it um, covers your current needs but also your um, future needs, because um, mm-hmm. you won't be migrating probably for another five ten years. Um, so we did some market research and looked at thirty platforms. Um, thirty platforms. Yes, oh. and uh, ten in detail, um, including like meeting solution architects, going through each of our requirements and so on. And can you maybe elaborate on, on this review process you, you had in place? Yeah, so I think first of all, you need to understand your business well. Um, so you need to understand your business, your product, your technology stack. We are very fortunate that we, most of the original developers and um, product managers are still with us. Uh, so there's a lot of knowledge uh, sitting in our teams. Um, I too have implemented many of the defining parts of the product. So um, everyone in the team uh, can contribute very well to this project. If you have joined recently and are pushing for change, or if you're like outsourcing this to an agency, the results are only going to be as good as your um, specifications. Mm -hmm. Um, So we ended up with a list of over 100 use cases and requirements, including user features, technical capabilities, back office functionality, as well as licensing and support questions. but then it also comes down to your complexity and product vision. How flexible does it need to be? Are your use mm-hmm. cases unique? Um, we then looked at the market and compiled a list of platforms to review. The p- first two platforms, without looking at the markets, were obviously staying with Magento 1 yeah. and its natural success in Magento 2. Did you take the uh, professional reports like Gartner into consideration? Yes, we looked at Gartner Magic Quadrant, uh, Forrester. Um, it gave us a first impression of the platforms because most of them don't really give a lot of information on their websites um, mm-hmm. it's may, uh, mainly uh, sales stuff and you have to yeah. sign up talk to them first before you get something out potentially even have to sign an nda um, so having 30 platforms on the list it was clear from the start that we have to narrow down the list um, by maybe by un- answering some fundamental questions um, are we going open source uh, is it going to be software as a service? Is it going to be API only, headless? Um, mm-hmm. And I, I felt like this is where the implementation starts. Really, it is fundamental that the plan works with your um, use case, the surrounding stack, the pre- business process, but also the skills and budget. Mm-hmm. Um, if you do, if you if you make the these decisions early on, um, then you end up. Was just carrying out that implement that the path you have um, defined 
while you were looking at the platforms. Um, so the implementation really starts quite early. Um, that's an interesting observation, yeah. So staying on Magento 1 was not an option for us due to the imminent end of life. And also it would have required us to make like huge investments in building APIs since the code is in views, models, and controllers. Uh, APIs would be new controllers, so you would need to make sure that uh, everything um, is working as before. Um, and it's outdated, so you would need to make it work with newer technologies. Um, disclaimer, for example, PHP 7.2 goes end of life in November, so you have to do um, work to uh, support 7.3. Uh, the dependencies would go out of um, mm. out of um, support as well. Uh, payment providers like Edien are cutting support for Magento 1 merchants, uh, so all that is uh, scary and risky. Um, and then we looked at Magento 2. Um, it seems natural. It's more developer-friendly than before uh, with Magento 1. But we have decided against it. And, the, and all, that despite the data migration probably being simpler. Um, so the, you, you can be uh, quite sure that the same functionality is uh, available one way or the other. However, uh, the database structure and the challenges out of that um, are still identical, I'd say. Um, so you need to do all the customizations and um, improvements again um, with the risk that it performs worse in this, uh, at the start. So you need to mm -hmm. um, do a lot of work to make it performant. And then how, I, is it going to scale with your future, um, future growth? Um, also, Magento 2, I hear that argument a lot, is Magento 2 can be headless as well. Um, but what percentage of the functionality is supported? Is there a list of um, this this feature is going to be only if you use the front end as well um, versus uh, the APIs. And also, for example, the marketplace modules, how many mm -hmm. of them are available for APIs? It's all just very unclear. Uh, it felt, and yes. it felt like missing an opportunity here by just going uh -huh. to Magento 2 because it's a whole new rewrite. If you don't get the benefits out of it, then I yeah, don't so, see much so, value. So, so, so what, what, what are you saying is, uh, to, to paraphrase it, uh, in your case, upgrading to Magento 2 would be pretty much the same amount of work like migrating to, well, any other platform. Yes, yeah, so uh, Magento 2 doesn't meet our requirements. Um, so we need to spend time building that functionality like we did um, over the years. Um, and I'm not talking about just some user features, but fundamental changes. Um, mm -hmm. And then also the performance question I raised earlier. So yeah, I think so, at least in our case. So uh, is the software as a service uh, and software as a service as a core, the best delivery model for, for software in 2020? Like a software that just works, you can start using it. Would you recommend an on premise platform for anyone in 2020? <laughs> That's a very good question. That and it's not uh, simple to answer. So, um, the, there was one more in the list which was open source, and that was Silius, and it also didn't make the cut. So, there weren't any open source solutions left. And so yeah. until now, we were like thinking we need to run it ourselves. We need to control it. We need to be able to make changes. Um, so the first thing was um, um, we struggled giving up access to the code. Um, and then the second bit would then be, um, is it going to be on-premises, closed source on-premises, or closed source um, mm -hmm. SaaS? And I think uh, if you have a closed source platform, it rarely makes sense to do it on-premises, which is in um, in most cases, actually, in your own cloud account. Um, it only makes sense if you don't trust the SLAs of the vendor, because otherwise you end up yeah, like with monitoring, right. configuring, upgrading yourself, uh, and you don't really have a clue about the platform itself because you don't um, own the code. Um, so, but if the vendor and the product are trustable, I think SaaS can work well. However, it's not straightforward still. Why is that? I think it's a general SaaS issue. Because um, if I recall correctly for us, none of the SaaS purchases we made were without surprises or disappointments. And by that time, you have already invested so much time into it or uh, you're tied to a contract that you can't change. So um, mm -hmm. you're committing yourself to something which might not work and they might not be ready to make changes for you uh, to make it work, to protect the platform. Um, so the team was uh, pretty worried about this. Are you suggesting 
to move um, our the core of our commercial business into the hands of others. Yeah. What if they down? What if we have similar issues like with the other SaaS solutions? Um, what if we come to a moment where um, they're not flexible enough and we have to restart uh, migrating again? And the management asks questions like, what if they go bankrupt? Um, what if the parent company doesn't work, want to support them anymore? And so on. Yeah, gotcha. So uh, you were nervous about going for a software as a service, but uh, the remaining platforms on your list are all software as a service. So how, how did you proceed from, from that point? I think you can only say due diligence. You need to yeah. do your research uh, well and uh, get your hands dirty, which isn't easy because most vendors don't support that. Uh, so they don't give access to their documentation straight away. Uh, they don't let you do POCs. And commercials is really great in that sense. The documentation is public and you can sign up for a 60 days trial anytime. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the next question was, um, are they really API first, these solutions? Um, and which I doubt it because um, mm -hmm. they are out there for a while um, and they just recently announced API first or headless or API only. Um, so in, it turns out that most of them are actually full stack with the API on the side. So you have potentially even dedicated APIs just for headless, um, which doesn't cover all the functionality. So you kind of need to differentiate between full stack functionality and headless functionality, yeah. looking at the documentation and make sure that um, it's, it's, it's noted um, and tell your user, your colleagues that they can't use uh, these functionalities in, in the admin because we don't support them. Um, for example, big commerce, they have two headless APIs, um, one for fetching products and one for checkout. Mm. Um, I'm not really sure what else they, um, they support with headless. Um, the, the other thing I would say really important is to know the platform limits. Because um, platform limits are usually hard limits, which you can't really like, um, work around. Like you, there might be workarounds, but they would be expensive, and um, they might even even mess up your data model or the way you run the business. Um, so you need to be really, really clear what the um, what the impact of that is. Um, for example, big commerce, given I mentioned them before, uh, they have a limit of how many variant options you can have. So that's the attribute. Um, the var variance of a product uh, vary mm -hmm. by, so like size or color. So the limit with big commerce is 250, and that's on the project. It's not on the individual pr product. Okay. So if you have one attribute, you can only have up to 250 values in that attribute oh, on, on the whole project. Uh, so um, we, but we have products with up to 500 variants on a single attribute. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have over 60,000 colors thanks to editorial color names. Um, so how, how are you going to um, represent that uh, attribute if you have to split it into uh, hundreds of uh, attributes? Um, but, you know, commercial has also hard limits. Um, luckily, they have summarized this all in a product, um, in the platform limit page in their documentation. Um, and the, the biggest limitation they have is the size of a product record in their database. Uh, that's limited to 60 megabytes. Um, you can guess from there what database storage they use. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, the, but it's sound a lot, right? Sixteen megabytes. It sounds a lot. Uh, probably more, many of many of the books or um, things you have out there are lower than sixteen megabytes. However, if you consider um, the product data in commercials has two stages, so you have the staging mm. and production. So you have already uh, a full copy, two copies in in the in the record. And all the variants are in there as well. All the prices okay. are in there. And uh, the way they handle product attributes, so these are attributes which are not different on variant levels, but are all the same for variants. They copy them into the variants rather than okay. keep it in the product. So you have a lot of data copied. And so depending on your data model, you may not be able to have as many variants or attributes or locales as you need. And that's, um, that's pretty scary. They know yeah. about this. Um, we've been talking to them. Uh, they have a few ideas, uh, but generally, I think this will be um, one of the limita limitations which um, will keep me up. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then also, like, don't don't really assume that um, 
things are standard and should be there, right? Like you don't need to check them because it's standard e-commerce. Multilingual um, is something standard nowadays, right? You would expect mm -hmm. all e-commerce yeah. platforms to do. But again, big commerce doesn't do that. Um, Shopify didn't have it until recently. Um, so documentation is important, needs to be complete and understandable. Um, and it needs to fulfill your requirements and use cases out of the box. Or if it doesn't, it should be achievable by yourself, um, either uh, by providing um, good workarounds, which are not impacting your um, general stack, or you can, um, you can build a service yourself and just mm -hmm. override the commercials um, or the platform service. Yeah. Um, and you, since it's a SaaS, uh, multi-tenant SaaS, most of them are multi-tenant SaaS uh, platforms, they are, they're going to be protective about that platform. They can't just make changes for you. It's on um, the service are sh uh, shared between, between uh, customers. I would also ask for the roadmap mm -hmm. as well, like you would, yeah. you, uh, so that you see where they're going, where they're heading to, um, and be very confident and familiar with how you customize these platforms. Actually, that, that, that's my next question. Like if you decide to go like API first, a uh, cloud first uh, platform, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, how you customize, how you integrate with, with your existing systems? How can you, you know, change the way this commerce tools or whatever platform you have behaves? Like how, how does it work? Uh, how does it work and how does it work for your project? It differs significantly between vendors. Um, so they actually um, have varying ways of um, customizability. Um, some of them don't really have at all. Um, you own your front end, so that's already good. You don't have the problem with your look and feel, but the data model and the APIs are still a problem. And I think that commercials have, um, has one of the best um, customizability options. Um, but they are also the least um, in um, changing the platform. Uh, changing for, for you. you, you mean? Yeah, so it's doing exclusive yeah. changes for you. Mm -hmm. um, but you can, like, the first thing you can do is you can. Um, design your data model so you can give signals to the front end um, or background, background process. Um, they have a really good way to um, to notify you about changes uh, by okay. um, sending messages to uh, some of the most popular um, que queuing systems, message systems. Mm -hmm. Like you can set up an SQS queue and bind a consumer to it. Um, that consumer could be uh, a traditional script running on a as a daemon on a, on a server, or it could be a Lambda yeah. function. Okay. Um, for example, you could do your ERP integration with that. Uh, mm -hmm. That is um, what Commercials um, calls an API extension. Oh, um, so this is a cloud function, mm -hmm. um, like AWS Lambda, um, where, uh, whereas um, where the previous method was asynchronous, like it would send messages after an event mm -hmm. has happened, um, API extensions are synchronous and they uh, are called before an event has been completed. So, for example, you can interfere uh, while an order is being created and reject that order. Um, and, then you, and then you yeah. can also like change the um, request and the response, which is a bit, which um, sounds uh, not great, but it's still a, a way to to make changes. Um, how, how does it work? It's like. Um... You are doing kind of, you know, uh, adapters and you know, proxies. Or... Um, so you can um, kind of like the front end would be very dumb and say, for example, I'm adding this SKU to the mm -hmm. cart with one quantity. Um, mm -hmm. And then either in your front end integration to commercials or in something like a middleware API gateway, you mm -hmm. would then extend that request with whatever commercials needs. For example, you would supply okay. the supply chain the supply channel, uh, some other fields which commercials uh, requires. But this is a way for you to manipulate that uh, request. Or in Makes the sense. response, you could add a few, you could pre-compile a few, a few things, maybe get, um, send a few more fields out. You could maybe get uh, information from somewhere else and extend the product data. And the last one is um, you, you can have um, external things or uh, custom uh, approaches. Uh, for example, if you don't want to use a text system, mm -hmm. you can uh, define an external text rate. 
If you don't want to use their product um, or pricing service, you can set uh, card items manually and still convert them to an order. Makes sense. And it's, it's also modular, right? You could say, I don't want to use a product service mm -hmm. at all. So uh, I, I won't be uh, so, so objective anymore and I must <laughs> ask you, why have you storefront? It's actually funny. So, um, you know, we spent so much time um, speaking about headless commerce um, that when we decided with commerce tools, Mm -hmm. um, that we decide on commerce tools. We um, our next topic was to decide on the front end. So right. Nigel, um, our co-founder, joked that you have convinced us to do a headless, and now you're saying we need a hat. <laughs> like yeah. um, it's um, it's quite interesting. Um, we had four options. We could have um, extended the existing community front end we have, which is Symphony and Backbone, mm -hmm. um, but then we felt like we're missing out um, since mm -hmm. they they are also rather outdated now. Yeah, um, we could use a traditional CMS and do like the commercial integration into that, uh, but then we don't have that CMS yet, right? So it felt like it would be another risk. Mm -hmm. um, we could have built our own front end, uh, but then the question is how long is it going to take and yeah. how well it's going to be built, or we could um, we could do it on top of an existing modern backend agnostic front end. Um, so a colleague. Um, mentioned for you storefront to me and we were like uh, excited straight away message patrick on that day and then the next morning you and me and philip patrick were talking um and i think the first thing we discussed was that bsf uh, one has um has this normalization concept right yes. so you yes. you in order to connect so many backends your front end needs to be protected from them and uh, so you're indexing stuff for example to elastic search and reading it um, yeah, from exactly. a from a normalized uh, format out of that Elasticsearch cluster, and uh, we were like, "Hey, <laughs> Commerce already has uh, great APIs. Can't we just use them rather than uh, putting this layer in between?" And Philip was like, um, "Hold on, I'm going to share my screen." And then he pitched us um, BSF Next as a concept. Yeah, which I, is... I remember this call. We had just this concept uh, back then. Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, it, it's exactly what we were talking about. So the backend, um, so the frontend would be talking to backend through a contract. Um, and then the contract, uh, the integration would be um, responsible of implementing that contract. Um, and these are composable, so you can swap them so that, for example, categories can come from a different platform than the products, or you can build your own um, or override your, uh, the composables. Uh, so that sounded really, really awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's, that's a funny story because uh, when 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 Philip shared the screen, we didn't have the commerce tools binding back then. Uh, we were just starting. So by uh, by doing this project together with us, you also decided to support Viewstore for Next community by investing in this uh, project, funding the commerce tools integration, and Viewstore for Next core itself. That that's really amazing. The next question that comes to my mind is how you, are you approaching this this migration and what's the really strategy? Yeah, so we since we are still making many changes to the user experience, like if you're removing features, mm -hmm. um, that's just on its own um, a risk. Um, so we we want to get as feed, early uh, feedback as early as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so we started early on um, to build the infrastructure for um, VSF um, all the way to production as early as January. Um, we d keep deploying the latest master of Storybook and Storefront UI uh, as an internal site um, so that everyone can see um, the UI changes we are working on. Um, we're about to deliver a try beta link in the header, mm -hmm. which will be disabled uh, for now. But once we are ready to share our work with the rest of the business, we would enable it for our colleagues only. Um, obviously, they can see it uh, uh, before in the Okay. Um, testing okay. environments, however, kind of soft launch, right? Internal yes, launch. Yes, yes. Uh, but we would also do it on on production. Our colleagues are our mm -hmm. most critical and also knowledgeable users, uh, so we are keen to get their feedback. Yeah. Um, but doing things also in uh, production, albeit hidden, ensures that you're doing it right. Um, for example, if the synchronization from Magento to uh, commercials takes thirty minutes for a small database, um, how long is it going to take for the whole? Uh, product catalog mm -hmm. um, and it also like allows the product designers to hold user testing sessions um, you don't need to like give them access to your test environments and so on 
Mm-hmm. Um, after we completed what we call the public beta scope, which is like the is a subset of the MVP scope, we are planning to open this to um, to all our users um, to to get uh, feedback as early as possible, so they okay. would know it's a work in progress. Um, and our users are quite passionate, so I'm um, I'm sure that many of them will try out and uh, let us know what uh, what they think. And once the MVP scope is ready, we will be doing um, split testing, so sending some so, um, portion of the traffic to the new front end, and that would be increased um, with confidence. And how you plan to sync the orders and you know the user accounts between all the new platform? Because I guess this is the biggest challenge when you are doing this split testing. Yeah, um, so user accounts and authentication, um, we're going to use uh, AWS Cognito in both the old platform and the new platform. Mm-hmm. Um, Magento orders are going to be imported as historical orders into commerce tools, um, but the front end uh, should not be talking to Magento, uh, at least okay. for the majority of use cases. Um, okay. When we're happy with the results, we would plan um, switchovers, locale by locale, to ensure that um, everything is right and we don't have an SEO impact. And also, like in case of delays or other complications, we have a few backup plans. It's, it's always good to <laughs> have a backup plan. I I uh, I will risk uh, a statement that everything now is JavaScript. Uh, does it mean that we all become front end developers? Yeah. So <laughs> JavaScript is a language. Um, it doesn't replace experience, right? Um, so in the end, um, the language might be the same, but front end and back end development still has its um, differences and its um, intricacies you know so having mm-hmm. uh having these experts um around is still useful yeah um but i think with storefront ui where we're defining components and the html and css is hidden uh and behind the scenes we might have more back-end developers um yep. risking going into the front end and um in- including this component and attaching an action to it and so on um so we do expect that most of the code from now on would be JavaScript. Um, in the end, it comes down to what's suitable for the job, right? So, um, but if the language is indifferent, if it doesn't matter, then we'd like JavaScript to be the fallback rather than the personal preference of a, of an engineer. Yeah. Um, so maybe just the the last question: um, Do you see any interesting forthcoming changes to the technology landscape for for e-commerce? If we stick to headless for the time being, um, I think it would be interesting to see how the larger players um, will do once they have uh, launched and battle tested their headless solutions, how they would uh, compete against uh, the contenders like Commerce Tools or about uCloud. Um, and I think I, I, I think there's going to be more ecosystem or more um, mm. something, not really a marketplace, but like services and tools which are servicing the headless platforms um, or integrations between the headless platforms um, more buy-in from um, from tools like analytics tools and so on um, so that you don't need to uh, build um, everything yourself so i think that would be uh, quite interesting however compared to for example like the magenta marketplace um, probably the um, results would be much more qualitative, um, but usually uh, going to be somewhat ent- enterprisey, which might be a um, which might be an issue as as all these things might cost yeah. and might require contracts, negotiations, and so on. Um, and on the other hand, um, maybe a hint to you <laughs> um, is that there would be then front-end platforms or things like that emerging to fill the gap um, on the other side of um, headless platforms on the front-end side.